If you'd open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we will get right to it. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I pray that for those of you who are uh, reading this with some regularity, you are finding uh, the arguments that Paul laying out begin to cohere a little bit. It requires thought. That's something that many of us <laughs> are not in the habit of uh, spending much time on. But this is exactly what we need to do. I wish I had all the time that the Lord gave me before he converted me. I wish I had that back. I wish I had that stored in a time bank somewhere. Uh, oh, that I had spent every breath of my life on Christ Jesus. But that isn't his plan. <clears throat> but let me, let me say, if you profess, if you profess Christ here this morning, thought, thought about what he has said is an essential part of your day. <clears throat> There's simply no way to live the Christian life without the inspired the infallible and the preserved word of God in your hearts. <clears throat> oh, this wonderful treasure, this wonderful Holy Ghost library that we have uh, should always be in our, uh, in our hearts and we should take time, take time to meditate, take time to think about what God says <clears throat> and give all of your efforts to finding out what he means. That being said, we're going to read verses 6 through 13. Chapter 8, 6 through 13. <clears throat> if you would please stand with me now, we're going to give our attention to this blessed passage, this very penetrating passage passage. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 6, this is God's word. But to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. Now, how be it, again, means however. However, a very important word. There's not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we better, the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ." Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Amen. Amen. May the Lord teach us these words and help us to understand them that we might apply them with all of our heart. Let's pray. Righteous and holy Father, I praise and thank Thee. I bless the Lord here this morning. I thank Thee for Thy goodness. I thank Thee that Thou hast revealed Thyself and given us Thy Word and creation. 
upon which we may gaze and by the power of thy spirit come to an understanding of thy greatness, thy immensity, thy eternality, thy infinity, thy mighty, mighty power. O oh God, forgive us when we have little thoughts of thee. Forgive our little minds for holding thee to the standard of our brains. O oh God, how great thou art. How great thou art. How faithful thou art. I thank thee that thou hast brought us here this morning. Although there was no other place on this planet. Then I would rather be than with his people. Lifting up our voices and hearing his word. Oh God, please come by the mighty power of thy spirit and work in our hearts today. Move, Lord, may we know the, the joy. May we know the sobriety. May we know, Father, the very thrill of thy truth. May we know its heavy and weightiness. May we see our God. May we see his will. May we understand it and may we walk in it. Oh, help us. Lord God in heaven, how we praise and thank thee that thou hast given us thy precious son. We thank thee that he walked this earth, that he kept the law in the place of all thy people, that he died upon Calvary's cross, bearing thy wrath, and thy indignation over our broken laws. And oh, Father, how we praise and bless thee that he rose again. Thou didst raise him. Thy mighty spirit did raise him. He rose from the dead. And we, we think of that every Lord's day. It is thy day. That blessed word, Lord's, makes this day sanctified from every other day. How we praise and thank thee, O Christ, for thy shed blood, for thy spirit, for giving us thy word, and for gathering us as a people. We thank thee for those thou hast given new hearts. O oh, how we love thy people, and I pray that we would grow in our love for thy people. And Father, I pray that thou wouldst give us hearts, hearts, true hearts for the lost. Give us tears for the lost, oh God, and for those in our midst today that do not know thee, even with the subject we are considering, I pray that thy spirit would fall upon them, open their hearts, bring them to a clear and a glorious and a joyful knowledge of Jesus Christ, the saving Savior. How we bless thee, oh God, in his name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free... Ye shall be free indeed. Now, what does that mean to us? What does it mean for Jesus to say to his people, to those he has made free, what does it mean to be free? Many in our country would answer one way. Many in our country would answer another. But what is freedom, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, well, <clears throat> we want to think about that just for a moment because it, it bears directly upon the text that we are considering. It is so. If Christ has made you free, you are free. You are free. Believers are free from the lordship of Satan. You are free from the powers of darkness. You are free from the bondage of sin. Do you hear this? Read Romans 6 until you can say it in your sleep. 
Sin shall not have dominion over you. It doesn't mean Christians don't sin. It says sin is no longer your slave master. Free, free. You are free to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. You are free from God's law as a covenant. You are free from the accusations of God's law. Christ bore them all. Free from the curses of the law. He bore them all. Free from the condemnation of the law. You are free from slavery to men and their unbiblical ideas. You are free from the fear of death. You're going to die unless you are one of his free people alive on the day that he returns. And we're a day closer to that glorious, glorious time. And you are free from the damnation of hell. Now let's be honest for just a few moments. Do you think about that? Do you believe that? Is your life being shaped by those things? Or is that just what gets repeated from the pulpit? It is just astounding when you read the letters that Paul writes. Most of the people he has known intimately. And what is he writing to them for? To encourage them, to bless them, to tell them that he loves them, and to correct them. Almost every epistle, not, not everyone, but almost every epistle, Paul's having to correct God's people because they're doing the things opposite to what Paul has commanded. He says things like, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things? Brethren, it is too easy for us to forget Christ in a day. It is too easy for us to forget what he has done to save his people from their sins. It is that that should shape our lives, not CNN. God forbid. <clears throat> not the, the, the media. Not what is constantly bombarding our brains. You can't escape it in this culture. You are regularly being washed with the water of the world. You are constantly having your mind assaulted with alien thoughts to Scripture. You deserve a break today. No, you don't. If you believe the Bible, what you deserve, when we're talking about justice, what every one of us deserves is hell. That's what we deserve today. But in His grace, Christ has saved us. He has taken the penalty of all our sins and saved our wretched souls. We hear that kind of stuff every day. Have it your way. No, the scriptures teach have it God's way, period. You are assaulted all day with anti-biblical, anti-Christian, and even anti-Christ thoughts. So then what does it mean to be free? <laughs> well, it means the things that we mentioned and many more. I took my children to an abortion clinic one, uh, one day when we lived in Louisiana. And there was a national organization there protesting the slaughter of innocents. <clears throat> and there was a young man who was holding up a sign. It said, freedom, freedom. He meant freedom to kill human beings, freedom to kill babies. Now, he was holding it up and saying, freedom, 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 and he even started shouting, freedom, freedom. <clears throat> so I, they had, uh, the, uh, the local magistrates had put up some fences uh, chain link fences on wheels to keep 
those who were protesting away from those who were crying out for the rights of the slaughter of innocents. And I said, I, I motioned to him. He came over to me and I said, uh, you're crying out for freedom. What is freedom? And he looked at me for a moment and he said, it's doing what I want to do. <laughs> you read the scriptures, you've just heard a profession of Satan. That's his doctrine. I do what I want to do. And I said, real freedom is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you are set free from bondage to serve the Lord Jesus. He looked at me again for a few moments. He held up his sign again, and he started saying, down with God, freedom from God. That's what's driving your culture. Now, most people wouldn't be so brass or crass to say it that way. <clears throat> but he didn't have any problem. At least he was being honest. But brethren, that's the culture you're living in. I'm not saying every single individual thinks along those terms. I'm talking about as a mass system. The system doesn't bow to Jesus Christ. That's what... Uh, the scriptures are talking about most of the time when it says the world. It is that satanic system that leaves God out, or at least the God of the Bible. It'll take gods and goddesses from all over the place, but it will not bow to the Lord, will not bow to the King of Kings. Are you free? If you're free, if you believe God through the blood of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit has saved your soul, are you free? Do you know that you're free from these things? And now the big question, do you know how to use your freedom? That's the problem lying at the heart of this text, how you use your freedom. We are free, but free to serve God, which we were not able to do previously to that. You can go to church. You can stop your wicked habits. So, that said, <clears throat> we truly are free in the Lord Jesus Christ. He sets people free from the bondage of sin and servitude of Satan. <clears throat> Nevertheless, our freedom in Christ must never become the occasion for other believers to sin. Mm, something's impinging on my freedom. And there is. You know what it is? <laughs> it's called love. Love as I've said previously, must guide our liberty. The liberty that we have in Christ must be guided by the love of Christ. And we have to know what this book says to know what that means. Now let us dive into this particular passage again. By the way, one of the most dreadful sins and mentioned frequently in the New Testament is causing other believers to sin. So, <clears throat> in part two of this message, we considered the danger of arrogant liberty. The danger of arrogant liberty. Liberty, arrogant liberty is all about me first. Oh, wait a minute. Doesn't that sound familiar? Oh, yes, that's my world. Me first. My place in line. My stuff. What I want to do. Do you understand 
that it truly is Satan's doctrine to do your own thing. It's what music tells you. It's what Hollywood tells you. It's what your flesh tells you. <clears throat> we don't even need any prompting from the things of the world, right? <laughs> you say, well, this is an awfully dark picture to paint of people. I didn't paint it. The creator of heaven and earth painted it. And it's, it's not a painting <laughs> as such. It is genuine truth. It's just truth. And it's a truth that we don't appreciate. <laughs> it's a truth we don't like being told, generally speaking. I mean, you know, we'll say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I know, I'm a sinner. And then confront somebody on their sin and see how friendly they stay. Just watch. Reprove, rebuke, exhort is what Paul commands Timothy to do in his preaching. Man, that'll make you popular, right? No, I can tell you, if I put a big sign out here and say, I'm going to be talking about who the Antichrist is for the next three weeks, we could fill up this building. But if I said, come and get your sins exposed, <laughs> even if I put them in flashing lights, now people wouldn't like it. They wouldn't like it. We don't like that. But that's precisely what Christ sets us free from. And it is precisely why we need to consider then what to do with our freedom. Because by nature, our flesh wants to do its own thing. It likes to be comfortable. Hey, I love you, uh, but I've got some things to take care of for me. I mean, one of the worst things that started being circulated out of the psychological world was me time. No, me time. I've got to have me time. I mean, really? I talk to Christ about that. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, the scripture says. Is that not so? How valuable is your life? Oh, my brothers, my sisters, and those that are not Christians. Jesus Christ came into the world to make his people free. But very often we stop at the, he paid for my sins. Instead of focusing from that to, now here's how I should live. So, the, Cor the Corinthians had asked Paul questions about eating food offered to idols. The problem is that they wanted to eat that food in pagan temples. The kind of temples they once worshipped in. They said, but meat commendeth us not to God. We learn that from you, Paul. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat. Eat not, are we the worse? Paul's reply is simple and powerful. But take heed, watch out, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. This liberty of yours. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> we need to know what to do with our liberty. And we need to know how to handle it in a way that brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and tells our brothers and sisters around us, we love them. <clears throat> it isn't just a matter of getting together and saying, oh man, you know, I love y'all. <clears throat> it's got to show up in how you live. And Christ tells us how to live. Well, Paul replied, to their argument about their right to eat in the temples in chapter 9. We looked at that very briefly last week. He argued with great passion that he had rights as an apostle, but he often denied his rights. And there it is. The forming, the fashioning of love. My freedom 
needs to have the stamp of love all over it. He denied his rights. And not only that, he had even denied his rights for the Corinthians. He said, you could pay me for preaching the truth to you. And he establishes it from the scriptures. But he says, but I went on and made some tents. Because I wasn't going to let anybody in your congregation say, Paul's in it for the money. Then he explained why he denied his rights to win Jews and Gentiles to Christ. He then used himself as an example. To the weak, I became as weak that I might gain the weak. Obviously, the Corinthians had not been concerned about the consciences of the weak. Mm. I wonder if any of us are guilty of that. I wonder if we consider weak consciences in our congregation. Hmm. Paul then declared, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What does he have in mind? Others. Others. What does he have in mind? Others, not just Paul, not just Paul's comfort, not just what Paul could get out of this thing. Here's what he rejoiced in. When a Jew repented of his sins and believed on Christ. Here's what he rejoiced in when a Gentile repented of his sins and believed on Christ. He wasn't just trying to notch his belt and count conversions under his ministry. 10,000 saved. It didn't matter who he was living around. He was, in one sense, Paul the Holy Chameleon. He could change colors. I'm with Gentiles, mm, bright green, right? Oh, I'm with some Pharisees, mm, dark brown, right? Paul said, and, and this is, it wasn't phoniness. He knew what they thought, and he walked with them in ways that would build them up. Wasn't anything phony about it. He denied himself. There's nothing phony about self-denial. It's one of the strongest characters of a person born of God's spirit. Because all of a sudden, you see that there are not three great laws. There are two. <laughs> love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, where's the me commandment? Where is it? Well, it's right in the middle. Love the Lord. Love his people. You're right there. There's your freedom. Freedom to love others and to deny yourself. And when necessary, suck up your liberty for the well-being of somebody else. And we have to learn how to do that. It's not always easy to discern. Eventually, we're going to get to real-time uh, applications, but we're still just laying all the foundations for, for getting a hold of this. <clears throat> so, he said, not only have I made all things to, I, I, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some, and this I do for the gospel's sake. And you say, well, he was an apostle, right? <clears throat> and why was he an apostle? To serve the Lord Jesus and to teach the whole world to walk in what Jesus taught. So he's living it and teaching it. So when we hear there are certain things that apply to apostles that don't apply to us, none of us here have seen the risen Christ. But as far as a moral life, it isn't like, oh, well, he's a pastor, he's a minister, he's a, he's a religious super being. Huh? No, 
We're called to live like Christ, taught by Christ, taught by his servants, taught in the word of God, and to live these things. When we don't, it damages God's people. Now, we know that here. For the sake of others, Paul denied his own rights as an apostle. And that's where we left off last time. So the, uh, the title of our message is Sacrificial Love and Weak Consciences, Part 3. This is Part 3. Our gracious Heavenly Father loved us and gave us his Son. He loves us and gives us everything through him. He loves us and has given us his spirit. He loves us and he's given us his word. He loves us and he's given us his people. And we need to love what he loves. So may the spirit of God fill us with love for our Savior and love for his people. Well, as I said, we left off under the heading, the danger of arrogant liberty. The danger. The Corinthians apparently had made the argument, food does not commend us to God, verse 8. Paul's reply <clears throat> that uh, be careful that your liberty doesn't cause a believer to sin. And that's what we considered last week. And as we've seen in chapter 9, verses 1 through 18, and chapter um, and uh, chapter 9, verses 19 through 23, he explained his reasons for doing so. He loved the gospel. He loved other people more than himself. That, friends, is Christian. So now we're going to summarize chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. I had hoped to make it through that last week and didn't. And it would have been a bit more coherent if I'd have been able to put this in. But number three, uh, and I, I do uh, ask your forgiveness this morning due to circumstances way beyond my control. Um, I was unable to have an outline ready for you this morning. <clears throat> so, in fact, if you have one from last week, you can pick up at one point. <clears throat> so, this entire chapter, brethren, is extraordinary. Chapter 9 is remarkable. I used to read it and just look at it in a very puzzled way. What is chapter 9 doing between chapter 8 and 10? It doesn't even seem to be connected. But we went over that last week. It is connected. All right. So, <clears throat> Paul uses himself as an example of denying his own rights. He does so for the spiritual well-being of the Corinthians. He does so for Jews and Gentiles. And that's what all of us are to do. And that is a beautiful testimony of Christ-like character. Are you a Christian? You're wearing his name. If you're wearing his name... There ought to be some family resemblance. That's right. <clears throat> it's not only a beautiful testimony of Christ-like character. It is a gracious example of his pastoral heart. It is a stirring motivation for Christian thinking and living. And it is humble obedience to Christ's command to love one another. All of that. And more in this chapter. So Paul has described his self-denial. Now he describes his self-discipline. That's what verses 24 through 27 are all about. And it's in the context of what we're talking about. <clears throat> know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize. Now, this was something they all understood. We may not get it right away. But they understood this. In Paul's day, Corinth was an entertainment culture. How about that? It was a sports 
culture. It was a sexual culture. Think Bourbon Street in New Orleans, written large. But that sports culture, so much like our own today, Paul draws an image in the minds of the Corinthians that they're familiar with. An athlete running in a stadium. They get that. Corinth hosted the Isthmian Games every other year. The event honored the false god Poseidon. And those athletic events were second only to the Olympics. The Corinthians understood the illustration. And Paul urged them with it. He says, so run. Okay, you, you all know what I'm talking about. The guy out there who's running. He's running in the race. He's not just going, you know, la, la, la around the track. He's running. And he's running for a purpose. He's running to win. He wants to win. He says, that's the way you ought to run as a Christian. He then explains his point. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. That means self-controlled. <laughs> That's a word out the window in our culture. <clears throat> Supersize me for everything. All right? <clears throat> it's temperate. It means self-discipline, self-control in all things. I mean... <clears throat> Those athletes that give themselves to setting those world records, generally speaking, there's, you've always got an exception, but generally speaking, they're not eating pizza the night before the, the, the big race. I wasn't attacking pizza, by the way, for those of you that might have had that negative response. Paul wants his readers to understand that winning such a race takes discipline, self-discipline. It takes rigorous training. It takes unflinching determination. It takes, listen, single-minded pursuit. He's not saying that Christianity is a game in which we compete against each other. That, 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 don't, don't draw that lesson. That's not his point. His point is the discipline it takes to win the race. And then he says, now, run like that. Christians, anywhere, everywhere, run like that. Be determined to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ in your thoughts, in your words, in your deed. Work out, pray. Work out, study the scriptures. Work out, worship with God's people. Work out, go with God's people to, when they serve the Lord. And then he does something so pastoral once again. He uses himself as an example. First, he describes himself as a runner. He said, I therefore so run, like I'm talking to you about. <laughs> I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. And we might miss that. But uncertainly is the idea of aimlessly, to no purpose. I mean, if I just said, run, and everybody got up and just ran in every direction outside, it would be useless. What would be the point? It would be aimless, uncertain. He says, no, run with a purpose. What's the purpose? <laughs> Bring glory to Christ. Bring glory to God to love his people. And you know what? It takes determination to love God's people. We're not always lovable, right? It's so. So then he describes himself as a boxer. He uses things around him that they will understand. He says, so fight I. Not as one that beateth the air. <laughs> he says, I'm not shadow boxing. He says, I'm not just swinging my arms around and missing the target. <laughs> I'm looking for a knockout. That's what I've trained for. That's what I'm in it for. Though if we're Christ's free people, what are we in it for? Well, 
some of the very things that we're talking about right here. We need to love God's people, and we need to love them with our liberty. That means we've got to be very cautious. You know what, you know what else it, it, it needs to, to prove to each of us? You need to know the people you're sitting in this room with. A lot of you don't, and that's a shame. You ought to know everybody. You ought to be praying for everybody. Not just get on your face and go, all right, Lord, help everybody. Amen. Pray for Brother Randy. You know? Pray for Pastor Clarence. Pray for Sayori. Pray for Charlie Luther. Pray for him and his family. Pray for his children. Write their names down and pray for them. Cry out to God for their souls. Give of yourself to them and for them. That's Christ. Nah, we like our own little bunch. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're not Christian. I didn't just say you were lost and on your way to hell, but I did say at that point, you are not Christian. So, Paul goes on to say, <clears throat> I'm not beating the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I'd love to be preaching through this whole chapter. But the fact of the matter is what he's telling us, the, the, the word is literally in I keep under my body. It means I keep my body under my discipline. I punish it when it needs it. In fact, literally, the word can mean I give myself a black eye. Now, we're not recommending that you go home and physically damage yourself. And that's not what Paul is talking about. Unfortunately, there have been many throughout the ages of the Christian church that have thought, okay, great, I'll go out into the wilderness and beat myself with whips. That will not make you holy. Right. All right? What makes you holy is to operate by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, understand his word, and treat other people according to that word. That's Christian. Now, there's more to being a Christian, but this is lying at the heart of everything Paul is arguing with, uh, arguing with the Corinthians for. I keep my body under. I make that thing my servant. Ha! In America? But look at the way we eat. <laughs> for those of us that are deprived, we can appreciate that. But for those that just get to eat what they want when they want, <clears throat> you don't know. You need to understand that we're walking with Christ. We are free, and you're free to eat what you want. <clears throat> but the, uh, be careful. Be, real, be really wise. And, uh, and, and you know, let, me, let me just say, plain, plainly and simply, as Christ-free people, that liberty that we have is to always be taking into account the people he's put us with. See, it's really easy to go to a church, hear a sermon, go home, and not think about those people the whole rest of the week. But that's not biblical. You're commanded by Scripture to know your elders. In 19 years, I've been asked to explain to someone my testimony once. Now, how's that knowing the fellow that's talking to you? <clears throat> and I could go down the line and just say, do you know him? Do you know her? Have you ever talked with him? Is he in your prayer list? No, I got my little bunch. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're not Christian. This is about loving what Jesus loves, and he loves all his people. <laughs> and you know, you know, you know that in your mind, you go, but I have a question about that one. Do you really love that one, Lord? He's not enough like me. Mm, that's a dangerous place to be. <clears throat> Paul demonstrates that he's denied his own rights to minister to these former pagans. When he started off preaching to them, they were just pagans. Raw pagans. How's that? for uh, the, the congregation you want to, to begin. 
You start with people that know zero, nothing. Paul says, man, I dearly love you all. He gave himself to them and for them. Mm. He knows that if they go into the pagan temples to eat, weak Christians may fall back into idolatry. That's underlying all three chapters. One of the primary issues in everything Paul is saying is idolatry. He's concerned that they're going to go back. You notice he doesn't go, oh, once saved, always saved. You shook the preacher's hand. You're okay. He says, man, I'm concerned for you all. You may go right back as a dog to your vomit. Tragic, tragically, many who profess to be Christians never left their vomit. <clears throat> Brethren, I'm saying to you, with all my heart and, and genuinely with love. <clears throat> These three chapters are the throbbing heart of, of a problem in many churches. People don't know each other. Big mega church. You think, you, you think a, a church with 3,000 people, those people know each other? Do you think the pastor knows their needs? I'm not attacking, you know, a large church. I'm just simply saying that <clears throat> this book talks about loving people and you don't love them with no idea of who they are, what God has done for them. And, and if you don't know them, listen carefully. Say he's, he's wandering off into a rabbit trail. No. If you don't know them, you don't know their conscience. And you don't know what they can handle and what they can't handle. And you can arrogantly sit back and say, I don't need to know all that. And I would say, you're in spiritual darkness. I'm not saying everybody here will know everybody and love everybody the same way that some of us do. But how can you think you're a part of a body when you're ignoring your lungs? Uh, yeah, I got a spleen, but I'm not interested in it. <laughs> it's doing some important things. Do you, do you not understand that every single person that, cry, that Jesus adds to his church, he has gifted, he's given them the Holy Spirit, and he's given them something you don't have? Sometimes he'll give you the same thing that somebody else has, but he's made you a part to function in a body. This is not a preaching station. If that's all you're here for, I urge you to go away. This is a body. God's people are to know each other. And then, I mean, how do you carry one another's burdens when you don't know the guy three pews back? I'm not talking about everybody digging into everyone's private life. But if you're just hanging around three or four people, I guarantee you, you don't know what's going on in your congregation. And you don't know what people's needs are. You therefore cannot know how their consciences work. And you may be trampling all over them. Well, let me, let me rush a little along here. <clears throat> for, for the reasons that we have discussed, Paul issues a warning in chapter 10. Idolatry is an issue. He describes Israel's great sins in the wilderness. Then he solemnly warns. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things. As they also lusted. Who were they? God's people. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. Do you hear it again? Don't be an idolater. Why is he repeating that? Because that's his concern about the puffed up Corinthians going back to the temple. 
We know there's only one God. We know there's only one Jesus. We know there's God's many and the Lord's many, but really there's just one God. We know all that. We want to eat at the temple. Paul's not just concerned about the weak conscience. He's concerned about the puffed up Corinthians. The puffed up consciences. Not exaggerating. He repeats himself again in verse 14. You know, neither be ye idolaters as some of them were, verse 7. And then he says, dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Paul then issues another stern warning. We all need to get this one beginning right here with the, the, one of the elders, and it should go right immediately to the other elder. <clears throat> Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Mm. Who's he talking? He's not talking to the weak people. He's talking to the people that think they know something. People that think they know something can make some unbelievable errors. And they can fall into great sin themselves. Take that in, y'all. It's important. All these things connect to this, what appears to be a fairly simple passage. Listen, let's go a little bit further here. <clears throat> Flee from idolatry. Now, we, <laughs> we know that as believers, we do have rights. We have rights. Why? Because we're children of the king. That's why. We're the brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we know the king of the universe. We have rights. We can stand before our God and look at his law. We can look at his wonderful word and realize, look at all the blessings I have in Jesus Christ. Look at these blessings. It's overwhelming. It's like I'm standing in a room that is wall-to-wall treasure when I open up the scriptures. Man, silver, gold, emeralds, diamonds, rubies, the whole thing, more than anything else in the world, more than uh, Bill Gates and George Soros put together. More than all of the guys that are billionaires because it is an eternal treasure. We have treasures and we have rights as God's children. But those treasures and those rights must be governed by love. Which means self-denial and self-discipline. So... <clears throat> Those rights should never be an occasion for other believers to fall into sin. So we must understand and practice self-denial for the well-being of others. That's what Paul did. And such a life requires single-minded self-discipline. Determined. Run to win for the glory of Jesus Christ. I want to get to the word stumbling block before we quit. So I'm going to rush and stop (laughs) because I want us to get a hold of this. All right, so we have foundational thoughts here, right? Paul, Paul has said, look, I deny myself for you, Corinthians. I know you all. I love you all. By the way, one of the things that we'll see in the, in the next few messages will be that Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 have a lot of things in common. And very often then, they're preached almost identically. But there are some differences. I've mentioned them briefly before. Let me mention them to you again. First of all, Romans 14 was the church at Rome. Paul had never been there. He didn't know them. He didn't establish that church. And he's dealing primarily with Jew and Gentile differences. Now, uh, many of the principles are the same, but there are some significant differences. We'll look at those. Then 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, this is a church that he established by the preaching of the gospel. He knew these people and he loved them. Boy, he knew they had problems. And he is wisely working through What he knows would split the church. Let me say that again. He was wisely working through what he knew could split the church and divide the unity that Jesus died for. Sometimes 
in pastoral work. As Paul plainly shows with three chapters of a long and twisted argument, if I can say it that way, how about a difficult argument? That'd be better. Twisted sounds like it's evil. It just takes a lot of turns. What's he doing? He's trying to keep both sides together. Do you hear that? He doesn't go after the weak people. In fact, if he goes after anybody, he shoots for the guys who are puffed up. But he doesn't, he doesn't cut them down. He's not, you know, uh, angry with them. What was he trying to do? He was trying to work through this situation so that the two sides would come together. That's very biblical. Your elders have attempted such things. And it can be long. And it can be hard. And it can be a great challenge. Paul had it. And was doing it to the best of his ability. So. The life he's talking about here. Must be single minded. It must be. Filled with self-discipline, and we must run for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will now do bird's eye view, and we'll stop and go to our baptism. <clears throat> Paul says in verse 9, once again, Take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block. Let me read. Let me read. A large definition and then I will read something on a fence and we will stop. <clears throat> but there was a great Scottish minister and theologian named James Durham. He wrote a book called of, uh, Concerning Scandal. And I've been leaning on his book regarding scandal and st stumbling block. In the day in which we live, scandal means uh, something um, that has stirred up public reaction. Some wicked thing, some immoral thing, some shocking thing. And we go, oh, it's a scandal. Uh, one of our magistrates recently was in a huge scandal. Uh, and he was being accused of immorality, etc., 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 as politics gen gen generally goes. Mm -mm. But when he's, Durham says scandal, that's not what he means at all. By scandal, he meant stumbling blocks. Stumbling blocks. It's a book about that thick. It's all on stumbling blocks. Uh, thankfully, that book is being re, uh, uh, re-edited so that it's a bit more readable. Uh, Durham is like reading a Scottish John Owen. And uh, <laughs> that's a challenge. <clears throat> Owen's uh, challenge enough in his, in his English. But listen to what Durham says in his definition. Now, you're not going to remember all of this. Uh, I will eventually <laughs> send this to you so that you can sit and think about it. <clears throat> he says, a scandal, a stumbling block, <clears throat> or offense is literally, a scandal is a stumbling block. It is because when something is said or done in a way that leads someone to sin or hinders their spiritual life. Listen to this again. <clears throat> a scandal, an offense, is a stumbling block. It is caused when something is said or done in a way that leads someone to sin or hinders their spiritual life. The deed or word is not necessarily sinful in and of itself, but it makes someone to stumble in their spiritual life because of its circumstances. Namely, <clears throat> it was done at such a time. Timing is everything in much of life. And certain things come together in life that's like, how did all this happen like this? How did we get a perfect storm like this? So it happens at such a time. <clears throat> In such a place. How could that have happened? At that church. How could that have happened here? 
How could that have happened in that family? All right? Now, this is, now listen carefully. Namely, it was done at such a time in such a place or by such a person. The more well-known, the more loved a person is, the bigger stumbling block they can drop right in the middle of God's people. That's why young people are very often crushed when uh, a leader uh, or a, 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 a well-known pastor is discovered to be in sexual immorality. I know of a particular family where two of the children have uh, no three of the children have completely left anything that looks like biblical Christianity because of the fall of two very well known um, family Reformation men. It was because it was them and the impact that they had had on the lives of those young people, and they looked at the sin and said, "All this is fake." That's putting a stumbling block in front of people. It isn't just the sexual immorality. It's what you've done to other people. Are we getting this? We need to. We need to. Well, an offense, I can tell you briefly, is exactly the same thing as a stumbling block. <clears throat> There's a slight difference. We'll look at that the next time. But it always means causing someone to sin or to stumble in their spiritual life. And we have a responsibility not to do that. We should be building up. Remember? Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Love should be driving us. Why? Because that's the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what did he say? That only begotten son. What did he say when he was here? I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. Stumbling blocks are the opposite of Christian love. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we praise and thank thee for the mercy thou hast shown us today. Oh God, how glorious it is. To hear thy people sing, to hear thy people pray, to hear thy word read and preached. And now, O oh Father, we have the explicit joy of obeying thee in baptism. I pray that thou wouldst grant us grace and wisdom and mercy. And that we might honor thee as we do baptism and the Lord's Supper. We pray, O oh God, your rich blessings upon your dearly loved people here today. Help us to love one another. Help us O oh Lord, not to set stumbling blocks before thy people. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.